All right, welcome to another video. The angles might be off. I might not be zoomed in enough or zoomed out enough. I don't really know. My boyfriend's not here, so I have to do it myself. <laughs> There's a couple books I've really wanted to talk about, just like express my love for them more. My reading year so far has not gone great. I've read a lot of three stars this year, and to be perfectly honest, I'm okay with that. I'm not someone who necessarily goes out of my way to just try and figure out what I like and only read that. I like pushing myself outside my comfort zone. I enjoy ingesting stories that sound interesting. Whether or not I think I'll like them, if I'm interested in it, I'll read it. But I wanted to talk about kind of the five things that I have absolutely loved this year so far. So this is a quarterly favorites video. I'll be talking about my top five favorite books. I'm not listing them in any order. I just want to talk about my five favorite reading experiences. I'm hopefully going to continue making quarterly favorites, though who knows, I always say I'm going to continue things and then you never see another video in that vein again. So in no particular order, the first thing I want to talk about is The Guest List by Lucy Foley. This took book two by storm and I thought for sure I wasn't going to like it and I actually really ended up loving it. Now as I mentioned in my wrap up for this, I definitely predicted who the killer was and I predicted why they were doing what they were doing. But that didn't take away from how well this was written for me. This is about a wedding that takes place on this secluded island. It is a very famous wedding because it is between a very notorious blogger as well as the star of a survivalist type show. <laughs> It has a ton of point of views between many, many different guests at this wedding, as well as kind of two different timelines, one taking place when they first get to the island and one a little bit later after the wedding where we know that something violent has happened. <laughs> I thought this was a really good thriller. I felt like every single character was interesting. Some of them were likable and you rooted for them. Some of them were unlikable, but like you still wanted to see what their story was. It had a lot of red herrings, a lot of threads that kind of pulled together. And that's something I think that's really important in a thriller and a mystery is you want to see how all these threads line up or intersect near the end. And I think this did a great job of that. It's not the most original thing. There are things that are predictable in this, but I feel like the characters are authentic. Their motivations make sense. And that's really, really important to me in a thriller. This definitely had that foggy, misty, sort of atmosphere that really lends itself well to a mystery. It talks about the bog a lot and the bodies of the bog. I enjoyed the themes and topics it tackled. I think they all really lended itself well to the characters as well as the story. I just think this is a great thriller and I can't wait to read The Hunting Party by Lucy Foley. I don't think I'm going to read The Paris Apartments. It doesn't sound that interesting to me, but yeah, this one was a winner. The next thing I'm going to talk about is 14 by Peter Kleins. This is a sci-fi that takes place in an apartment building. This revolves around a main character who really doesn't have a lot going on in his life. He's in his early 30s and he's just at that point where he feels like he should have figured it out by now. I can relate to that. He meets other people who live at this apartment building and sparks up a friendship with each of them in turn. They are all kind of like him, just a little bit lost trying to figure out what to do with their lives. They all start to notice some weird things that are happening in the apartment building and so they band together to figure out what the hell is going on. Now the way the story started off, I kept laughing at how stupid it felt. On the cover, people compare this to Lost, but in an apartment building instead of on an island. And I was like, that's a big swing. Like, say whatever you want about Lost, but that first season, the first couple seasons really, there was so much going on and every mystery was interesting. You wanted to figure out where this could possibly go because they throw so much stuff at you and you know it all ties together somehow. And this, it felt like all the mysteries were really, really mundane. Oh my god, this wall is kind of cold. And I was like, okay, this is just so stupid. These are the dumbest, most boring mysteries alive. But I think that was kind of a point. This guy has nothing going on in his life. And so even though these mysteries are small, he lets them take over his life because at least it gives him a direction. And when this book starts to kick off, holy shit do things go down. There are so many books that I pick up that have the same sort of idea where it's like building this vague sort of mystery. And they kind of end up going nowhere. They end with some sort of open ending like, was there something going on or was this person crazy? And with this, that is not what happens here. They 
go there. <laughs> they come up with some crazy ass shit and I just loved every fucking second of it. I will say some of the character work was a little weird. I wish that the friendships had been built up just a bit more so that when they started doing like the witty banter and bugging each other and stuff, I just like wish that felt a little more earned. But overall, I loved this book. I can't wait to read more in this series because yes, it is a series, but I think they're standalones that kind of just exist in the same world. But like, I cannot imagine what this writer is gonna come up with in the next one. I'm stoked. Another book I absolutely adored was Hex by Thomas Old Hevold. This is a horror novel that takes place in a quarantine town. They're quarantined by a curse. They can leave the town, but they can only leave for so long because if they leave any longer, this witch that put a curse on them will make them want to commit suicide. This witch literally exists in their town. She walks around with her eyes and lips sewn shut, and it is said that if anyone spends too long near her or hears what she's murmuring, then once again, they will commit suicide. Now this has been going on since like the 1800s, and so they have it pretty well handled at this point. They have an app that runs and tells them where in the town the witch is. Everyone knows the rules of the town, that you can't tell the outsiders what's going on, that you can't leave the town for too long, that you can't fuck with the witch. Like, there are very clear guidelines here. But of course, a group of teenagers just hate that. They feel like they're in a dictatorship here. <laughs> and so they decide to try and film some prank videos where they fuck with the witch and s to see what happens. <laughs> I fucking adore this from beginning to end. It really starts off pretty funny. It almost feels like a satire. It just, it has such a great sense of humor about it, but things get darker and darker as they go and it was so good, so effective. I love the way the tension built and some of the shit that they do here, the way the teenagers act in this book will make you want to scream, but it's so authentic. It's so fucked up. The way some of these teenagers act and how their pranks escalate, the way their humanity breaks down, it's just so good. I love the ending. Like, I truly just love everything about this. The way the curse comes about and infects people, also so interesting. I love this. Everyone should read this. It's so good. These are themes you've seen before, but this is such an original and unique take on it. The next book I want to talk about is actually something that I only gave three stars at the time, but it's something that has stuck with me so much, like I've spent so much time thinking about it, that I still want to include it on this list. And that's Saving Noah by Lucinda Berry. Her writing is very basic, and that's why I only gave it three stars. I wish that everything had been a little more beefed up. It just feels like the descriptions and stuff were very thin. But the content of the book will stick in your brain forever. This is about a woman whose son confesses to her that he has been touching the girls that he coaches. He's a 15 year old boy. The girls he coaches are like six years old. She in turn feels like they need to tell the parents of the girls that he molested, and so they do, and they end up going to the cops, and he goes to Juvie. The book starts with him coming out of Juvie, and her and her husband having to figure out how they're gonna deal with him now that he's home. I definitely have some problems with this book, like the fact that the mother is so self-centered for like the first half, as well as the fact that it is extremely emotionally manipulative, but I still think that it brought so many interesting things to think about, that like I really loved my reading experience of it. The way that it tackles this topic of what do you do when your son has done the absolute worst thing imaginable? How do you handle that when you still love this person so much? You brought them up, you raised them, you've spent every second of your life dedicated to protecting them, and yet somehow this has all gone wrong and he's done something horrible. And then how do you stop it in the future from happening again? Then of course they talk a little bit about, you know, nature versus nurture in the sense of how do these things happen? How does someone want to do that? Is it something they're born with? Or is it something that can be trained out of them with psychology and therapists? 
you know, is there a treatment for pedophilia? It's dark as fuck. I don't necessarily think you have to feel empathy for the person who's done these horrible things, but you can still want to learn about why those things were done. I do think it leans a little too hard on the sympathy side of things. I think that even if you can't control your thoughts, you can control your actions, and... But I can understand wanting to empathize when you are the mother of this child who's done this. Lucinda Berry is a psychologist, so she brings a lot of knowledge to the table. While I wish the writing was better, I think that this book was so interesting that it was well worth the read. I will definitely be reading more from this author. I guess I'll be reading more from all these authors, like, duh. And then the last book I want to talk about before the smut <laughs> is The Lost Causes of Bleak Creek by Rhett and Link from Good Mythical Morning. I honestly had kind of low expectations going into this book. That sounds bad, but just YouTubers, celebrities, anyone writing books who isn't already an author or who isn't known in a bookish space, I tend to have low expectations. <laughs> but I really ended up enjoying this, especially because of the, like, the vibes and atmosphere. It was just kind of perfect. This is about three best friends, two boys, one girl. They're all very young. I think they're around maybe 13 years old. And they're all on summer break trying to film a little movie together. One of their scenes goes wrong and they end up injuring someone in town and she gets sent away to this religious boot camp on the edge of town. The two boys think something weird is going on in that boot camp and so they try to investigate because they want to get her out before something bad happens. Like I said, the summer vibes of this were perfect. If you're the type of person who loves, say, It by Stephen King or any of his other books that kind of take on that same atmosphere where it's a group of kids banding together to research something, think Stranger Things and the like, then you'll, I think you'll really enjoy this. This definitely has that same like friendship and bonding and coming of age, trying to figure out your feelings for one another, like are you just friends or do you have a crush on this person, fighting over which is cooler, a bicycle or a scooter, like stupid things like that that just take up childhood, taking your imagination and playing with it and trying to do something with it. So much of that I think is universal to childhood and it really brings you back when reading this. That stuff worked so well, but so did the horror aspects. Some of the stuff that went on in this book totally got underneath my skin. Some of the more grounded stuff, the more religious stuff, was clearly ripped from like headlines, like I've seen some of these things before. And they were things that stuck with me as a child and they're things that stick with me now. Like, like just the thought of it still makes me uncomfortable. I still find it horrifying. Just the way that parents can subject their kids to trauma because they think they have no other option, because they don't know how to control their child and they trust some other person knows the answer. It has a little bit of a sci-fi twist to it that I also really enjoy. I just think this was a genuinely good book. Who'd have thought? The audiobook is not narrated by Rhett and Link, so don't go into it thinking that. I personally didn't love the audiobook. I think this is better to be read physically, but yeah, it was a really enjoyable one. So those are my current quarterly favorites. Hopefully I will have some more good picks in the next three months. And I hope you like this video and I hope to come back again soon. Bye.